Greetings, beloved. Okay, it's been a while since I last uh, streamed or posted any audio or video messages. And, uh, of course, the main reason for that is the, um, the uh, special military operation that's been conducted um, in Ukraine uh, with the stated goal to protect the people of Donbass region Luhansk and uh, Donetsk, uh, former regions, which now are um, republics independent from the mainland Ukraine. And so, you know, it's a quite an occasion, and you know, all the hullabaloo and uh, effects of that, and the all the sanctions and the uh, basically embargo which has been imposed upon Russia by the so called uh, collective West. So, <clears throat> and that's the, that's the kind of main reason. But uh, be that as it may, um, last time I uploaded my, what I call a two cents on what's going on in Ukraine or banderization of Ukraine. And it's on YouTube and uh, it's been what, two weeks, I guess. And here's a, a little add on to that uh, message, but it has a particular twist, a, uh, in a, an attempt to look deeper into a very interesting question. Yesterday, I was chatting with a friend of mine who is now in Poland, and they asked me this question, and we kind of, we agree on what's going on. Our, our uh, perspectives match, pretty much. And they said, uh, how can a Nazi ideology, which is a state ideology of the current regime in Ukraine, bland with Christianity in general and with Reformed theology in particular. How can a Nazi ideology bland with Christianity in general and Reformed uh, theology in particular? And this was a very pointed question, and uh, the background of this question is that there are many uh, Presbyterian and Reformed pastors and Christians in Ukraine who support their uh, current uh, st government, which is overtly Nazi in, in their symbolism, in their ideology, and in their practice in suppressing, uh, maiming, killing, slaughtering, Russian speaking and uh, Russia leaning populace of the East Ukraine. Okay, so it has this, uh, in the, and I have some thoughts that I wanted to share with you all. But first of all, uh, I want to clear some nonsense which has been circulating in response to the claim, the Russia's claim that uh, current Kiev's regime, you know, the Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian government is really a Nazi um, state with a Nazi ideology. They say, look, if, uh, here's the logic, they say, if Ukraine were a Nazi uh, state, President Volodymyr Zelensky, who is Jewish of Jewish descent would not be would not have been elected a president and the logic seems simple and very appealing that Nazism means Holocaust since Zelensky is Jewish and he is the president of current Ukraine therefore and he's still alive and he's a president Therefore, Ukraine cannot be a Nazi state. Well, let me uh, clear this not because it is a, a nonsense. A, a Nazism or, or any supremacist uh, ideology is not necessarily anti-Jewish. Now, Nazism, the classical Nazism of uh, Nazi Germany, of course, was 
uh, you know, blatantly and overtly anti-Semitic. And we all know the, uh, the horrific acts of extermination and the attempted to exterminate, uh, uh, you know, Jews from the face of the earth with all the death camps and everything else. Now, but uh, you must also remember that uh, there's uh, actually a greater number of Soviet people, mostly Russian and, and Belarusian and Ukrainian, basically Slavs that uh, died in World War II. We paid, I mean, this the Soviet Union paid a greater price even than uh, the number of uh, Jews that uh, were killed during World War II. And uh, Slavs were also targeted by Hitler, even though they wanted to live above 30 uh, percent of the, you know, former Soviet population for them to be slaves to uh, German occupants and those uh, uh, who would be German population would be resettled in the territory of the former uh, Russia and Soviet Union in order for them to be servants and to serve the uh, better race. So for that purpose, the, they would leave about 30 percent, you know, one third of the population. The rest, uh, they would also, they would have exterminated if they had their way with the uh, with their plan. And of course, uh, that Fortunately, that did not happen. Now, um, you know, Nazi ideology it, it tends to be anti-Semitic, and uh, the parties and the movements within uh, very active in the current Ukraine are also anti-Semitic in nature, but it's been subdued because of a reason. Uh, the main supporter and sponsor of the anti-constitutional illegal coup of 2014, which is called Euromaidan or Revolution of Dignity, falsely so called, the bloody coup. Uh, it was, uh, of course, backed by the State Department. And Americans and then the British allies and Canada and other countries and Germany and NATO allies, all they poured a lot of money in building, supplying this anti-Russia project called modern Ukraine. And uh, all the ammunition and everything else from the state. And therefore, the militia groups, the so-called right sector and battalions, of ultra-nationalists with overtly Nazi um, flags and symbols and everything else and tattoos and swastikas. Uh, they were sponsored by, and have been sponsored by, you know, uh, America. Now, America has a very strong Jewish lobby. And therefore, since they're getting all this money from America, I mean, Ukrainian Nazis who um, openly glory in uh, their spiritual forefathers, such as Stefan Bandera, a creator of Ukrainian SS battalions and, uh, uh, and uh, other uh, divisions which were instrumental in killing thousands of Poles, you know, Polish uh, people, um, gypsies and uh, communists and, and uh, Russians. Uh, they, uh, they have all this bloody heritage, but for now they're getting their money from the U.S. and since anti-Semitism is universally um, condemned in every so-called civilized uh, country, especially in Europe, therefore they have suppressed their 
hatred for the Jews. And as some people have observed, Russians have become the new Jews in modern Ukraine. So it is the Russians that are targeted, that are ridiculed, gone after, uh, and, 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 and killed, and must say, in, uh, in uh, eastern Ukraine today. So the new uh, targeted ethnic group for the new Nazis are not Jews, at least thus far, because they're getting their money. By the way, uh, one of the main Ukrainian oligarchs, uh, a, a ty tycoon, if you will, is uh, his name is uh, Benjamin Kolomoisky, and he is the main sponsor of Azov Battalion, which is now uh, in Az uh, Azov was so um, conspicuously, so brazenly Nazi in all of its its symbolism and ideology that even the United States, the Congress. Uh, has um, pronounced it extremist and they even passed the legislation that prohibited any support going to this group because even you know the states which have been you know acting quite cynically because they're they've been using these extremists extremists uh, against russia they said look we can't go this far, you know, these SOBs are so overtly Nazi that we cannot in good conscience support them, even against Russia. And so, um, so that's just for your information. You can look it up on the internet. It's uh, everywhere. So, but one of their main supporters in, in Ukraine, the oligarch by the name Benjamin Kolomoisky is also Jewish. So that apparently is no hindrance in the way of uh, supporting this overtly Nazi uh, division in Ukraine. And they're, they're part of there. They've been incorporated in the uh, military forces of uh, Ukraine. Okay. So, and also you can look at, uh, you can look it up, uh, the information, if you type in the Jewish collaborators in uh, World War II, uh, you'll find many names, uh, many characters of Jewish descent who were one way or the other helping uh, Nazi Germans, e even in their uh, uh, you know, demonic activity of uh, exterminating their own uh, kinfolk, their, uh, their own blood. So <clears throat> that's no, no, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean. So the, the argument that Zelensky is a Jew, therefore uh, the claim that Ukraine is a Nazi state, the current Ukraine is false because Zelensky is a Jew. Now, there, there can be useful Jews even for this overtly Nazi uh, regime, okay? Now, to the question, how can a Nazi ideology blend with Christianity in general and reform uh, uh, Christianity in particular? Now, <clears throat> as I've said, uh, there are a number of pastors and, and laymen especially of Reformed and Presbyterian uh, persuasion in Ukraine, who are supporting, very su uh, supportive of um, their Nazi state. <clears throat> How can that happen? So we're chatting with, uh, with this friend of mine, and uh, I say, well, there may be some uh, pretty much surface reasons like the money. Okay, you have foreign missionaries, they come in, they establish their missionary centers and their, their churches and so forth. Then they train and support pastors of a, of a particular persuasion. And since the monitor support depends, the, therefore you kind of, you pretty much go along with everything that they say. It's not just the gospel, not just theology, but uh, 
uh, all right, if the, it's the, uh, you know, the uh, transmit other values beside the gospel, that the U.S. foreign policy, that uh, and they say, well, you know, let's go just along. So maybe just the uh, such mercenary reasons. <clears throat> but not everybody is uh, is that way. Some people uh, can in uh, be supportive because of other reasons, and sometimes it's just the impression. The you know people, and we've experienced that ourselves in the early nineties after the fall of the Soviet Union, with all the influx of the missionaries and Billy Graham and uh, and other evangelists and and all sorts of uh, people, Campus Crusade for Christ and the charismatic uh, leaders and the Baptist missionaries and so forth, just pouring in from all over the place, but mostly Americans. We had a number of American. Uh, preachers and evangelists um, coming in in all of the post-Soviet uh, republics, Russia and, and Uzbekistan. Uh, you know, originally I come from Uzbekistan, so we had uh, quite a few. And so what you what you get is that uh, uh, you have nice people who uh, appear to be preaching the gospel, spreading the light, the truth, and the teaching open in the Bible. So you get this nice impression. Then they would. Uh, uh, set up uh, home groups for studying the Bible. They would uh, uh, lay up cookies and be friendly and smile and say things God loves you and everything. So they would uh, win the crowd. And people say, look, Americans are so nice. They're bringing to us the gospel and good cookies and good food and everything else. So if they're right about religion, they must necessarily be right about other things as well, because America is a beacon of, of freedom, of goodness, democracy. And this is the, the image that uh, uh, America is trying to promote. And But uh, we all know that uh, it's not always the case, that America is not always uh, spreading good stuff, you know. So that's that. Uh, another factor is... And this is more uh, to do with um, the, the Reformed side, especially, because as you know, the Reformed confessionalists, they uh, use a lot of uh, confessions and the documents uh, which have been created historically in the West someplace, in Europe. You know, the Heidelberg Catechism. This is, you know, Heidelberg is, is a, a town in Germany. Or Canis of Dort. This is Holland, uh, Netherlands. Uh, Belgic Confession, there you go, Westminster Confession of Faith, Westminster Larger and uh, Smaller Catechism. So all of those are sort of imported documents, and people who uh, buy into all this, you know, great Protestant heritage and all these great confessions, and they're, you know, good and useful and so forth. So they're kind of trained to rely upon stuff that is coming from the West, okay? It is... It's all, well, do you have anything translated on this? I'm always approached by people because I'm bilingual. They say, well, brother or not, do you have anything translated on this issue or on this question of tongues or you know, the Holy Spirit or, you know, whatnot? People rely upon translated concordances, um, you know, Bible uh, um, interpretations and so forth, and and that's and that makes a person really to be dependent, and it teaches you to view the foreign influence as an enlightening experience. That uh, well, they know. Okay, it's good biblical Christianity we're being taught is always coming from the Europe. And also, they had Reformation, and they say, look, you never had Reformation in Russia. You're yet to experience true Protestant or, or Biblical Reformation, because what you what you have here is a bunch of uh, uh, superstitious uh, Eastern Orthodox churches, 
or pietistic uh, Baptists who are uh, very uneducated and so forth. So we are bringing to you a true uh, standing biblical Christianity so that and so people, again, are taught to rely upon everything that's coming from the West. And, and therefore, they are become susceptible to bond into uh, West uh, American exceptionalism, that America is a city upon the hill, everything it does is right. So even if it uh, sends bombs, if it, even if it bombs uh, Iraq, for instance, even if it starts a war, it must be a good cause. And America is completely justified in bombing the crap out of Iraq because we know that Colin Powell, uh, he shook, uh, he held in his hand uh, some sort of a, uh, a little bottle with a white powder claiming that this was a... Uh, bulletproof uh, evidence that Saddam had weapons of mass destruction back in 2003. And then America went in and so forth overthrew Saddam and what followed was this bloody mass, mass and uh, close to one million uh, people died, casualties and in, um, in what went on was the you know all this mess and then the war the civil war and between the different factions and uh soon after uh isis emerged in this uh out of this chaos and vacuum of power in the middle east and so on so and but uh people and christians Evangelical Christians, Protestants, living in post-Soviet uh, territory, they tend to go along with the U.S. foreign policy very well and smoothly. They say, well, you know, they're good missionaries, they're bringing us the gospel, therefore what they're doing in other countries must be good, okay? So, but... <clears throat> Uh, also, about Reform and, and Presbyterian folks, uh, it's not just the confessions. It's uh, also a band within Protestantism, especially the mainstream Reformation, the so-called Magisterial Reformation, as you know from the history, this idea that the powers that be can be resisted, the idea of um, lawfulness, of armed resistance. If a government is tyrannical, then Christians are not only uh, allowed, but even bound to take up arms and resist the government. This, this idea is also uh, very much alive in, uh, in the evangelical and Baptist circles in the United States of America, even though not all of them are uh, reformed and persuaded, they're not pro they're not mainline Protestant. But the point is that since America historically had to fight against the, uh, um, you know, the British uh, Empire, and this they revolted and and uh, became independent, but they had to fight for their independence. Therefore, this idea, since it has worked historically, and uh, just as in Europe, religious wars were, in fact, national bloody wars, since religion and the state were intermingled at that time, and uh, there were no such thing as a separation of the uh, church and state. Therefore, um, Protestants had to fight for their uh, freedom, not only of religion, but freedom and liberty of existence. The very existence was at stake. And therefore, there's this bend uh, towards um, justifying coups and, uh, uh, you know, basically... Uh, 
overthrows of legitimate powers if the situation uh, justifies it, okay? Also, the idea of national covenants within the uh, Presbyterian uh, tradition. You know, the so-called national covenants and the National League and Covenant in uh, England and Scotland. You know, the Westminster uh, Confession was not just a nice document for Presbyterians. It was sort of a national covenant in this idea of uh, English nations entering into the solemn covenant with God, uh, what they believe to be the true expression of religion uh, embodied in the Westminster larger and smaller catechisms and, and, the, and the confession so that the whole population was to stand under those documents and to swear before God Almighty that we as the nation, one nation under God, shall serve the Lord in the purity of the Reformed religion. And they say, and since they believe in the in uh, you know the infant baptism, which kind of binds all the future generations, even unborn, so that all of the English-speaking countries are necessarily bound by those covenants. And there are Presbyterians in the states today who believe this uh, very seriously. Okay. And, the, and this whole idea of Anglo-Israelism, meaning that, again, the English-speaking countries are the new Israel, and therefore, they are the city upon the hill. They, they're the ones who are to bring the light of true Christianity to the rest of the world. And everything that stands in the way must be overthrown, okay, in order for this great Christianization to take place. So any independent powers and so forth. So here's the political twist to it, okay? Uh, and also, I've personally met some American uh, Presbyterian and Reformed back in Ukraine, back in 2004, I visited uh, both Odessa and Kiev. Uh, where they have their branches of the mission stations and also the uh, very large uh, evangelical reformed seminary of Ukraine. And uh, I considered studying in that institution. Well, not never t took place. I went back to Uzbekistan at that point. But nevertheless, so I, I, I visited Ukraine and, and I met some, uh, some people there, uh, missionaries and so And uh, as far as I know... All of them later on, that was, you know, I visited in 2004 and 2014. They all were supportive of this Euromaidan, even though if you look at what actually happened. And I do heartily recommend again, I mentioned that in my uh, previous video on this, that uh, if you haven't watched, please do watch this documentary by Oliver Stone called Ukraine on Fire. Ukraine on fire. Heartily recommend because it really unfolds how it actually took place, and it's not a peaceful process. It's it was a carefully orchestrated, arranged bloody coup, sponsored, backed, and supported by uh, Victoria Nuland, you know, uh, State Department and uh, prominent uh, senators and congressmen, John McCain and other people. We're all, oh, America is with you. We're supportive of your democratic choice and so forth. So it was all carefully calculated and uh, orchestrated event. And, um, and so the idea, well, some, some missionaries, I suppose, uh, can be supportive of uh, such an event because it allows them to have a better access to missionary work. So they may not necessarily be supportive of a Nazi ideology, but since uh, the, the whole thing was to, um, the idea was to separate Ukraine from Russia, to set it against Russia, and to turn it, uh, its face, 
towards Europe and America. And therefore, CISAT becomes uh, very much disposed and open to European and American influence. Therefore, we can flood in, we can uh, have greater access and uh, greater stability in, uh, in all of our activities in Ukraine, not fearing that uh, some local powers would question um, our activities, you know, whether we should be here and so forth. So, so I guess that's also um, one of the reasons why um, you know, overseas Christians support and those who sit under their teaching. Okay, so this is my two cents. This is my attempt to explain that there's such a, even though in in uh, in its basic and stark reality, there can be no blend of Nazi ideology with Christianity because in uh, in its root. It's a, it's a sinful desire to limit the scope of the second, second greatest commandment to love thy neighbor as thyself. Remember the story in Luke 10 where um, one lawyer wanted to justify himself when uh, and he said that... Uh, that the law is, uh, what does the law say? So he said, well, thou shalt love the, the, the Lord thy God with all thy heart and mind and soul and so forth, and thy neighbor as thyself. And Jesus says, well, thou hast answered right, this do and thou shalt live. But he, that lawyer, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, and who is my neighbor? So here's, here's uh, my understand the scriptural reference to uh, supremacism, okay? Any ethnic racial supremacism. The question they ask, who is my neighbor, okay? Oh, these folks are my neighbor, but not that ethnic group. They are not my neighbor, all right? And I can vent my anger and my frustration, and I can blame this group these dogs these under humans for everything bad happening in in the world it's also the ventilation of uh, conspiracy idiocies and so forth just as the jews are in the popular sometimes anti-semitic sentiments they, that people tend to blame the uh, the jews for everything they say well it's just you know this is the jews that the masons or they find some group now, Russians and Ukraine have become this uh, hated ethnic minority, even though they're not a minority. You know, they say by the time that the uh, Soviet Union um, collapsed uh, in the early 90s, over 60% in Ukraine identify themselves as even as ethnic Russians. Just the... Uh, leave alone the fact that most people do speak Russian and it's their actually first language. You know, they try to speak Ukrainian is sort of a dialect. Not everybody actually speaks it, even in Ukraine. Uh, nevertheless, they, they, they try to enforce the Western uh, linguistic culture of Ukraine, uh, Galicia, uh, from uh, places like Lvov, which is on the border with Poland, they wanted to make that a pretty much new I Ukrainian identity. And I, I sort of described that situation in my previous video on that, so I'm not going to go into that right now, but uh, that's what happened. So um, <clears throat> that's that That's that for now. Uh, hopefully next time we're going to proceed with other things that I just wanted to um, explain this question. All right. May God bless you all. Hopefully talk to you next time.